It's the Maxwell Institute Podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. You've heard of C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity. Maybe you've even read it. Perhaps you bought one of the 3.5 million copies that have sold since 2001. It's one of the most popular Christian books of the last century. But what you might not know is that Mere Christianity, the book, was almost an afterthought in C.S. Lewis's work. In fact, it wasn't originally intended to be a book at all. In this episode, you'll learn more about the origins and the life of mere Christianity than you ever knew from George M. Marston. He's an award-winning historian of American religious history. In this episode, we discuss his new biography of mere Christianity. It's the latest volume in Princeton University Press's Lives of Great Religious Book series. You can help support the Maxwell Institute podcast by reviewing it in iTunes or taking our survey at bit.ly slash survey. Questions or comments about this and other episodes of the Maxwell Institute podcast can be sent to mipodcast at byu.edu. George M. Marston is a historian of Christianity and American culture. His recent book is a biography of C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. It's part of Princeton University Press's Lives of Great Religious Books series. Thanks for joining us today, George. Uh, my pleasure. Now, you're a distinguished scholar of Christianity, but you're also a Christian yourself. And uh, at the beginning of your book, you talk about how writing a book like this isn't a detached academic exercise. So I'd like to hear a few thoughts about the relationship between your faith and scholarship and how that works in the academy today and how that impacted this recent book. Well, first, I think there is not any really detached scholarship. Every, all all uh, books are written from a particular point of view. And so I make a point in, in uh, throughout my career of uh, saying that I'm writing from a uh, Christian perspective and other people can write from uh, other perspectives. But uh, rather than acting as though there's some sort of neutral, uh, more scientific, objective position, uh, I uh, think that truth in advertising means you should say where you're coming from and then people can accept you know, they, they can accept that, they can agree with it, or if they disagree, they can discount my point of view, but uh, they can take it uh, take it into account. So uh, that's in general worked very well for me uh, as, as a way of being able to speak uh, from a perspective of faith. And, and it means that if I think something uh, is important uh, from a faith perspective, I can, uh, I can go ahead and, and just say that and don't have to be apologetic for it. So you brought that sensibility to C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity, and Mere Christianity isn't an autobiographical book. In fact, C.S. Lewis wrote his own uh, autobiography about his conversion in a book called Surprised by Joy, but in this book about Mere Christianity, you explore ways that Lewis's personal life impacted what became Mere Christianity. So let's talk about Lewis's life, kind of his background leading up to his work as a Christian apologist. Well, Lewis was, uh, he was born in 1898, and he grew up in Protestant northern, so Protestant in Northern Ireland, and uh, his family uh, were uh, Anglican church people. But uh, uh, as a teenager, Lewis lost whatever uh, religious faith he had, and then he had to serve in World War I for, for the British, and uh, like many people of that generation, he became very disillusioned as a result of the horrors of the war. And then he uh, went to study at uh, Oxford and uh, was in the midst of uh, many people who were uh, skeptical. Uh, and uh, then the story of, of the next decade or so of his life is one of gradually becoming more and more open to thinking, well, maybe there is more to the universe than just uh, a, a meaninglessness that, uh, th that you would have to accept if you accepted a purely uh, materialistic uh, view of reality. And so he uh, began step by step coming toward Christian faith. And, and finally, he's actually helped uh, very much by uh, a long conversation he had with his uh, friend and colleague, J.R.R. Tolkien, who was a Catholic. And Lewis became convinced that, uh, the, that Christianity was true, and he converted uh, to, he became an Anglican uh, Protestant Christian. Uh, and so uh, mere Christianity is 
in, in a way, taking people on the journey that he himself had uh, been on, and, and people have described it as uh, it's, it's, it's like someone who is a, uh, a, a guide to a difficult uh, trip, but he, can, he knows the way he's been there and can show you, and, 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 and he has, has a very kindly manner in, in helping you along the same path. So before Lewis got to Mere Christianity, or uh, he had also worked on some other projects, including a series of, of novels about space, sort of almost science fiction type novels. What was the story behind the, that project? Well, uh, he, he, after he became a Christian, he, he became interested as a sort of advocation to uh, try to help other people appreciate uh, the virtues of Christianity versus the vices of the modern world and uh, the space trilogy is three books about uh, travel to uh, planets that uh, have history histories different from uh, Earth. For instance, in one one, one of them, uh, there's no uh, fall of Adam and Eve and, and sin introduced into into the into the human race. People are still uh, innocent. And in these uh, novels, he uh, uses them to critique uh, modern thought. The, the villains in the piece are uh, scientists who want to use th th these uh, planets that are discovered for their own purposes, for materialistic ends, to exploit them or to enslave their people. And uh, so Lewis is saying scientism is really a, 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 an, an, an evil outlook in the modern world, and he's using uh, he's contrasting uh, the uh, a, a Christian uh, viewpoint, uh, to, or he's presenting a Christian viewpoint in in a, a sort of veiled way by uh, by by showing uh, the superiority of some of these uh, uh, other places to uh, what's, what what we find on Earth. And Lewis himself wasn't the only author that was coming to faith at this time. He was kind of part of a broader trend of conversion where a number of prominent British uh, British literary figures were coming to religion, people like T.S. Eliot and so forth. What was behind that movement? Well, I, I, they're, they're all people who are seeing some of the, the, the weaknesses in, in, in modern thought. Uh, G.K. Chesterton was one of the early ones. Dorothy Sayers uh, was, was one. And uh, they are uh, looking at the modern world and, and seeing uh, emptiness there and, uh, it, 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 and, and rather than uh, simply being disillusioned as a result of World War I, uh, they're, they're, they're looking for uh, something more substantial in the past. And uh, I think in Great Britain, uh, there was a greater sense of uh, the past that Christianity uh, was a long tradition that you could draw on, and so intellectuals uh, were more likely to turn to Christianity in, in, in that setting than, than perhaps the, the, in the United States, which tended to be uh, somewhat more anti-intellectual. And this was all kind of playing out in the context of, of world wars. In fact, the most immediate context for mere Christianity was war. So uh, talk a little bit about uh, the place of of Christianity in Britain at the time and, and how the war was setting the stage for uh, Lewis to become a well-known apologist. Well, it's an interesting uh, story that uh, what, what becomes mere Christianity starts out as broadcasts on the BBC during World War II. And the, the uh, Great Britain was uh, actually uh, less religious than the United States was at that time but uh, had more formal public religion. It was still, in, in, in public ways, uh, supposed to be a Christian nation, though, though it wasn't really very Christian. And so the BBC, which had a, a pretty much a monopoly on radio broadcasting, uh, had a very strong religious department, which meant uh, basically representing mainstream Christianity uh, on the air. So. Uh, there was a direct a religious director, and there were regular religious broadcasts, not only on Sundays, but uh, but but during the week, uh, in, in, as regular parts of of their of their broadcasting. So there's this informative 
talk genre kind of thing. These these broadcast talks that are happening, and different people are delivering them. And there's a figure uh, at the radio there, J. W. Welch, and he's looking for someone to talk about Christianity for a, a lay audience. Um, how did he become aware of C.S. Lewis? Well, he he had read a, a earlier uh, and actually apologetic uh, book that uh, Lewis wrote about. He called the problem of pain. And it's a defense of Christianity, and Welch was impressed uh, by it. And so he wrote to Lewis and, and asked him whether he might be willing to, to give a series, a uh, brief series of, of uh, religious talks uh, on the BBC. And, and this, uh, you know, this fit in with, uh, as I'm saying, the, the program, they, 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 they needed quite a few uh, religious speakers to, to fill their time slots. And Lewis had kind of been preparing for this, probably unbeknownst to him, by uh, some of his service in the Royal Air Force and talking to other lay Christians. Talk talk a little bit about that. What prepared Lewis to try to reach a popular audience? Yes, he. he it just happened that uh, during the war, also he was uh, asked to to give some informal talks to. Uh, we're all Air Force bases, so so on the weekends he would uh, travel by train uh, to these Air Force bases and present uh, various things about Christianity, and and that proved to be very helpful to him in getting to know how common people thought and spoke because he, he was getting responses from them, and at first his talks he didn't think went very well, but he, he learned very quickly, and, and, and he became very good at listening to the language of, uh, of, of the common people. He was a student of the history of language, and, and he had a very good ear, and so what he realized was that in order to present Christianity to ordinary people, you need to translate it into the vernacular, and, and, and he afterward uh, often said, if you want to be an effective uh, communicator of Christianity, you have to take your theological doctrines and translate them into the vernacular. And if you can't do that, you probably don't understand your doctrines very well. So, so he used that experience talking to different uh, people and presenting Christian ideas to lay audience to help prepare for these talks. And what people should understand about mere Christianity is it wasn't originally intended to be a book at all. It, it, it was born in these broadcast talks, the first of which was delivered uh, on air on August 6th, 1941. And uh, talk about the preparation Lewis had to undertake to deliver those because it, it took a lot of, a lot of work and, and especially in the context of the war. Yes. When Lewis was asked to give these talks, this was in 1941, and the uh, Blitz bombing was still going on in London, and the talks were, were to be uh, broadcast from London. So uh, it looked like a risky proposition. By the time he started in August, uh, the, the bombing had, uh, had stopped, fortunately, uh, for him. But it was still, uh, in a wartime uh, setting, everything that was broadcast on the BBC had to pass through the censors, so he, he had to write out exactly what he was going to say, and then it had to be edited so it exactly fit uh, the time slot because there, there couldn't be any uh, dead times on the air because if there were, there was a, a German uh, broadcaster known in England as uh, Lord Ha Ha who would... Uh, uh, broadcast prop German propaganda uh, on 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 the on, on that frequency. So uh, the, these talks took uh, very uh, precise preparation. And he had to write them out so that, as you say, the the censor could review them. They there wasn't room for improv here. He had to read these over the air. They had to be a set time. They had to fit within the time parameters. And so he ended up doing these five talks originally, and they were so successful that the BBC invited him to deliver uh, more sets of talks after that. Talk about the initial reception that the broadcasts got as, as they were first delivered. Well, as, as the talks went, they were, they were relatively successful. And, and there are uh, there's some stories of, uh, it's actually two, two independent stories of uh, people in, in pubs where there were uh, army 
from Air Force Service people, and Lewis came on the air, and, and someone said, everyone listen, and people uh, quieted down to, to actually hear him. On, on the other hand, uh, because Great Britain was a uh, only a nominally Christian country, there were lots of people who didn't like Christianity at all, and uh, were not happy with that kind of Christianity being broadcast on the air, and particularly there were some professional atheists who uh, were very critical of uh, of Lewis. One of them was George Orwell, uh, the author of 1984. He was a, a, a very skeptical person, was very dismissive of, of Lewis. And also uh, Lewis's Oxford colleagues uh, often were very critical of here. here's this professor who is cheapening himself by uh, these popular religious uh, uh, pitches. And that impacted his career going forward as well, didn't it? Some of, not just the broadcast, but also the fact that he was publishing all these books and becoming kind of a minor celebrity. It impacted his career. Yes, he was, after the war, he was um, the, the logical choice for a prestigious chair at Oxford. And, uh, but the opposition to him was so strong that that, that was blocked and eventually – uh, Cambridge University uh, really took the opportunity to offer him a chair uh, there, so he had to, you know, with some trouble, uh, he actually continued to live in Oxford, and, and but he had a, a position in, in Cambridge. But yes, the, the opposite, he, 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 he said that uh, you wouldn't believe how much uh, my colleagues uh, you know, despise me because of this be, being a, a representative of, of traditional Christianity. And you had mentioned some of the um, some of the atheists, some of the prominent atheists in Britain. There, people like George Orwell. And one of the things he criticized Lewis for was what we talked about as being one of Lewis's strengths, which which was his ability to translate things for a popular audience. And there's a quote from George Orwell where he talks. He's kind of dismissing C.S. Lewis for using slang like jolly well and so forth. And, and Orwell just did not like the style, but he was also more worried, I think, uh, about. Lewis being some sort of throwback to medievalism or something is that is that right? Yeah, he said, well, there's a, there's always these, these these chatty apologists for Christianity, but they're going to fade away, and and yeah, this is at, at at the time when he he thought that um, scientific views would would eventually prevail and 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 religion uh, would fade away, as a lot of people uh, did at that time, and um, yet yeah, to, to Today, it's the, the the scientific views that are more beleaguered than than, than the religious views, and, and people like Lewis and Lewis continues to be very widely read. Right. There's an irony here because in 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 the United States, Lewis's reception was a little bit different. Whereas in Britain, you had um, prominent uh, atheists and so forth criticizing Lewis. Uh, in the United States, you had more conservative evangelical people who were very cautious with Lewis's work at the outset. Yes, in the United States, uh, there was a, um, in, in the 1940s, during the, during the war, and World War II, and the 1950s, there was a lot of public piety. And uh, so, in general, Lewis was, was pretty well accepted in in the cultural mainstream, and he was even on the cover of uh, Time magazine in 1947, uh, Henry Luce, who uh, was the uh, owner of Time, liked to promote religion of any sort, and so he he, he promoted uh, Lewis. But uh, even so, the uh, more conservative evangelical people were a little suspicious of Lewis. They liked the fact that he was a traditional Christian and he uh, believed in a real devil, for instance. He had written, uh, his most famous book by that time was The Screwtape Letters, uh, which is the story of uh, an elder devil writing letters to a, a junior devil who's, who's trying to keep a, a young man from being converted. And so evangelicals like that a lot, but they were suspicious that uh, Lewis wasn't quite 
orthodox enough in the way that they liked. He didn't emphasize starting with uh, an inerrant Bible, uh, the way uh, they they talked and they smoked and drank. So uh, paradoxically, uh, Lewis was more popular among the main line churches like Episcopalians and Presbyterians and so forth more than uh, in the the more conservative uh, evangelical circles at that time. One of the other issues that came up um, with some of the people that responded to Lewis involved his – one of the broadcast talks on sexual morality. Um, what kind of controversy came up uh, as a result of that? Well, that was uh, one of the tabloid papers in, in London got a hold of his talk on sexual morality and – uh, published it as though it was some sort of sensational uh, talk, and it it, it wasn't really uh, it wasn't really that sensational. But it was at, at that time talking at all about sexual morality could be controversial. So it was um, more sort of you know, picking something to be to be critical of. And and, and one of the interesting uh, critiques in America was from Alistair Cook, who was British, but it was living in America, and, uh, and, and he critiqued uh, Lewis because he thought that Lewis's uh, conventional uh, views on sexuality were, uh, were retrograde, and, and uh, he, he was for more uh, open views on, on, on those sorts of issues. Including like men's and women's roles and that sort of thing. And, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, now, that particular... Uh, broadcast drew about 1.5 million listeners. In fact, most of his broadcasts drew about that many listeners, and it sounds like a lot. However, you point out that uh, you know the BBC News that evening drew in 16 million. So his voice wasn't. It's not that he was unknown, but he also wasn't hugely. Uh, it, well, yeah, it wasn't as though. I mean, somebody uh, once said that he was one of the most best known voices in in all of England. I don't think that's the case. There actually were uh, some other religious broadcasters who had bigger audiences than he did. So he he, he was well known. He was uh, you know, very very successful in what he did. But it, but it wasn't like he was sensationally popular at the time. What was it like to listen to Lewis as he delivered these lectures? Well, he he he, he was a very effective. Speaker, he was he was one of the most popular lecturers at Oxford, and as I said, he also knew how to speak to an ordinary audience. and And the BBC had a monopoly on broadcasting at the time, so he pretty much had to be addressing everyone. and And uh, you can, if if you go online, you can look up uh, C.S. Lewis's original broadcast, and you can get one of the one of these broadcasts, and and you 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 hear it's a very engaging style. It's it's uh, has a bit of an Oxford tone, but it's not uh, off-putting the way uh, that tone can sometimes be. But it, it's uh, just more engaging. In these talks, I think the same thing about prayer. Don't have an to other people. Let me explain that. History isn't just a story of bad people doing bad things. It's quite as much a story of people trying to do good things. But somehow something goes wrong. We've learnt how unsympathetic, patronising and conceited charitable people often are. And yet hundreds and thousands of them started out really anxious to do good. And when they'd done it, Somehow, it just wasn't as good as it ought to have been. The old story, what you are comes out in what you do. A crab apple tree can't produce eating apple. As long as the old self is there, its taint will be over all we do. We try to be religious and become Pharisees. We try to be kind and become patronizing. Social service ends in red tape and officialdom. Unselfishness becomes a form of showing off. I don't mean, of course, that we're to stop trying to be good. We've got to do the best we can. 
If the soldier's fool enough to go into battle with a dirty rifle, he mustn't run away. But I do mean that the real cure lies far deeper. Out of ourselves and into Christ, we must go. The change won't, for most of us, happen suddenly. And I must admit that for most Christians, it'll only be beginning to the very end of our present life. But there are some in whom it goes further, even before death, far enough for you to see it. Their very faces and voices are different. When you meet them, you know you're up against something which, so to speak, begins where you leave off, something stronger, quieter, happier, more alive than ordinary humanity. People have said, you know, he, he speaks like uh, an uncle uh, telling uh, his nephew uh, the rules of cricket. So he's modestly popular at this point. Um, he's put out, He's done these lecture series for the BBC, and you talk about how he takes these and publishes them in three separate little paperback books. This is before Mere Christianity. Um, what was his goal there? Well, he, he simply published these talks because he didn't, uh, it, people were writing to him. It, when you're on the air like that, uh, lots of people wrote directly to him, and he, would, he, he, he was very conscientious about uh, answering correspondence. And so he would get huge piles of, of correspondence and and some people would come to him with their their personal marital problems and all sorts of things that he he, he didn't <laughs> really, uh, feel competent to uh, to talk about. So he wanted these published so people could refer to the publications to say you know, to understand exactly uh, exactly what, what what he said. I've actually read uh, I read through the collected letters of C.S. Lewis, and it was interesting to see all the different kind of questions that he got, and, and that, as you said, he really did make an effort to respond to most people who wrote to him, and that, that was a – it seemed like a tremendous amount of work. Yeah, it was very, he was very conscientious, and he didn't, he, he didn't have a lot of extra time, but he would um, – the first thing in the morning, he, 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 you know, he said he'd, he'd read the, the mailman coming – because then he'd have this pile of correspondence he'd have to uh, respond to the next uh, the, the next day. But he, he felt that was uh, one of his obligations. So this is around the time, uh, 1942, when the screw tape letters came out, as you mentioned, and that really catapulted his image. Um, a lot more people became familiar with his work, and he had already published these uh, the broadcast talks in three separate books. And by 1947, he it seems like Lewis felt like he'd had he'd had his heyday. In fact, you write about how he's even feeling like maybe he'd done everything he could with regard to popular apologetics, and maybe he felt like stepping back at this point, maybe doing something else. Yes, he he. Uh, there, there's several indications that after World War II, he he was done. He was done with broadcasting. He was done with with writing these popular apologetic books, and in fact, he does turn to. Uh, writing the Narnia books, which he began in 19, uh, 1947. And he also had expressed in multiple places uh, a sense that there was a, a danger about doing apologetics. Yes, he, he remarks that uh, after he's given a set of arguments defending Christianity, often his own faith is, is actually weakened by that because he could always, as you can, think of counter arguments that might have been given, and and it reminded him that your faith isn't really built on uh, arguments. That arguments are valuable supports for the faith, but but they're not sufficient uh, for the faith because arguments can always uh, breed breed counter arguments. So. I think he was beginning to find doing apologetics just not uh, as edifying for himself as as, as, it, as it might be. Or, or I think he, he, he may have thought that he said pretty much everything he had to say. Now, there's also a debate that he engaged in in 1948 with uh, Elizabeth Anscombe, and this has become somewhat legendary. People have speculated as to whether his apparent failure in this debate led to his reluctance to engage in apologetics further, but you, you say it probably had less of an impact than, than people think. Yes, I, I, I think there's, uh, as some biographers have said, 
there's evidence that he already was moving in the direction of, of working on the Narnia books. But the, there was this very dramatic debate that Lewis was the uh, head of what was called the Socratic Club at Oxford, and they had debates on philosophical, theological uh, subjects, and, and he was known to be a very formidable debater. But this uh, woman philosopher, Elizabeth uh, Anscombe, was a, a, also a very formidable debater. She was actually Catholic, but she was critical of uh, an argument that Lewis had given in, a, in an apologetic, earlier apologetic book on miracles and on technical philosophical grounds. And she was an analytical philosopher and, and Lewis had not studied that kind of thing. So he felt vested in the debate. And some people speculated that that he, he sort of gave up on apologetics and turned to uh, the Narnia books in, in, in despair. But uh, it's not, I don't think that that really uh, has much to it because in fact, he uh, eventually responded quite well to Anscombe and revised the section of his uh, Miracles book uh, that she had criticized and, and fixed it up to, to suit the, the, the arguments that she had given. And that's, that sets us up really well to get to the moment when mere Christianity is actually put together. We're talking today with George Marsden. He's a emeritus professor of history at the University of Notre Dame. His books include the Bancroft Award-winning biography of Jonathan Edwards, and today we're talking about his biography of C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. So the mystery that, that no one has solved and that, that remains even in your book is whose idea it was to actually take these three books, these broadcast talks that he'd previously published, and combine them into this one book and call it Mere Christianity. But talk about at least uh, when that happened and how that kind of came about, as far as we can tell. Well, Mere Christianity was published as a single volume combining these three little books in uh, 1952. And there, there simply doesn't seem to be any correspondence that survived as to whose idea it was, whether the publisher suggested it or Lewis had, had, had suggested it. But uh, it's part of the story of this book that never was uh, designed to be a, a single book. And uh, as a sort of afterthought, Lewis put it together as as mere Christianity, and it really uh, eventually took off after that. So he releases this book, and mere Christianity. Uh, you you note in chapter five that it mere Christianity emerged as a single volume with no trumpets and fanfare, and it came out in. Britain in July, and then in the United States in November of 1952. And it kind of, I mean, no trumpets or fanfare here, but some people noticed it. Um, evangelical Christians had kind of been setting the stage uh, f for the release of this book. Talk about how people like Billy Graham uh, enter into the story. Well, as I said, uh, at first evangelicals were a bit suspicious of Lewis, and he wasn't quite their style of evangelical, but uh, Billy Graham actually uh, met Lewis in 1954. Uh, he was, Billy Graham was doing a crusade in England, and uh, evangelical pastor John Stott uh, set up a meeting with, with, with Lewis, and, and Lewis was quite well impressed uh, with Graham and, and, and Graham with Lewis. And so uh, there, there's a beginning of, of what became a very close relationship that uh, at first Lewis was more popular among mainline denominations, but uh, in later decades, he became more and more the evangelical apologist. And, 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 and if there, I think if there's a hierarchy of saints among American evangelicals, Billy Graham is at the top, but, but C.S. Lewis is uh, not not far behind. That he, he's sort of the go-to apologist for an awful lot of people. Now, it wasn't just people like Billy Graham that were taking notice of Lewis. One of some people might be surprised to hear that 
that there was a professor of apologetics uh, at a place called General Theological Seminary in New York by the name of Norman Pittinger, I think is his name, or Pittinger. Yeah. And he, he, he came out just with some blistering attacks of Lewis. He called him a dangerous apologist and an inept theologian. Uh, this was yeah. a turning point for Lewis. It's what amusing, in, in a way, an amusing story. In 1957, Billy Graham was giving a uh, doing big, uh, very successful uh, evangelistic crusades in New York City, and the Christian Century, which is a leading liberal Protestant uh, magazine, didn't like Billy Graham, and uh, so Pittinger, who didn't like Billy Graham either, uh, sort of saw Lewis as uh, as representing this old time religion that was out of date, and so he writes this very condescending, uh, scathing uh, account of Lewis's apologetics, and uh, that really. Uh, Sort of woke Lewis up again as as an apologist, and and he responded with a brilliant critique of uh, of, of Pittinger and, and explaining that uh, that he he's not trying to do a professional theological thing; he's trying to translate for the common people. And he had and, and he said, I, you know, I have to do this because you uh, professional theologians are are missing the boat, and people people. Don't understand all all the, the the very subtle things that you're saying, and you, you say something with one on one hand, and then you take it back the next the next sentence. Where uh, I'm just going to do a straightforward kind of thing, and 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 that uh, actually after that, Lewis does some more. Uh, he gets a little bit back into a, a apologetics. But it seems to be a little bit reluctantly – at least I guess he's trying to be more focused about what projects he does because like in 1956, Billy Graham is launching Christianity Today. That's a you know, kind of a, a rival to a Christian century, a, a Christian publication, and he's invited to contribute to that, and, and Lewis declines that. Uh, kind of says, well, I think those days are over. Yeah, he, he well, in, in 56, he was still um, – he was a little. He didn't want to be too closely identified with American evangelicalism. He mm -hmm. thought it was a little too populist, and uh, it, it didn't. I don't think it suited his his taste. Even though he liked he liked Graham well enough, but this uh, the, the the episode with with Pittinger the next year, I think helped draw him back. Right. Was sympathetic to those circles. Okay, okay. And, and he stayed busy too in other ways. I mean, he, he continued to write, so he was he was still writing Narnia fiction uh, fiction books at this time, doing some literary criticism. He was also writing other books for Christian audiences. Um, there's Reflections on the Psalms in 1958, The Four Loves in 1960. Uh, and then in 1964, letters to Malcolm, chiefly on prayer. So he's heading into the 60s here, and you say that there was good reason to think that a book like Mere Christianity would just kind of fade out. We're coming up on the 60s. What explains that? Uh, Lewis, uh, Lewis died in 1963. He actually died the same day that uh, John F. Kennedy did. And... Uh, Shortly before his death, he said that he thought you know, most of his books would would soon be forgotten, that they they would go out of style. And uh, in 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 the later '60s, when you're beginning to get to counterculture and people, everyone's talking about new things and the you know, age of Aquarius. Uh, other other commentators are saying, "Well, Lewis has had his day, and he's he's fading away." And uh, that uh, seemed to be the, the, the expectation. But uh, in what's remarkable about the story of the book is rather than fading away, it really begins to take off in, in uh, really beginning in, in, in the 1970s so that uh, there's an accelerating sales of mere Christianity so that you get to the 21st century since 2001, it's sold more than three and a half million copies in English alone, and it's also been translated into many languages. And that's far more uh, than it sold in its uh, first 15 years. So uh, it's a very unusual book 
that rather than you know, making a big splash and then the ripples fade away, it starts without a, a huge splash and, and, and actually the, 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 the waves are, 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 are growing of its influence. In, in some strange and unexpected ways, too. And after C.S. Lewis died, there are a lot of Christians who kind of started to make Lewis over in their own image. Like he kind of became a crypto Catholic. Uh, Mormons began taking interest in C.S. Lewis and, and picking out Mormon elements of his his thought. And then there's this really unexpected story that has to do with the Watergate scandal. Yes, that, that's very important for the story of mere Christianity that Charles Colson, who was a sort of um, known as a sort of henchman for uh, Richard Nixon and the Watergate scandals and was facing going to, to jail for the shenanigans that he had uh, managed, uh, was given a copy of Mere Christianity by a friend who, who showed him some passage, the chapter on pride, and, and this really touched Colson's heart, and he took the book and, and uh, read it very carefully and was converted to Christianity, and uh, when he came out of uh, prison, he uh, wrote a book called Born Again, which came out in 1976, the same year that, uh, at almost the same time that Jimmy Carter on the campaign trail talked about being born again, and uh, that became a bestseller, and there in the middle of this bestseller is this story about the impact of mere Christianity. So that really, uh, helped accelerate the sense that uh, mere Christianity is a book to give to people if they're questioning their faith or they're, they're looking to Christian faith. And, and I can't tell you how many people have said to me, oh, that's the book that really helped me find, you know, I was brought up in the church maybe, but you know, once I read that, it just all came together and, and, and it all made sense. And, and so that publicity helped other people see it as, as, as really the go-to uh, book if you're, if, if you're helping someone who is quest having questions about their faith. Yeah, so you had some celebrity-type conversions, not only uh, Colson from the Watergate scandal, but you also mentioned Francis Collins, who served as head of the Human Genome Project. I think he was something of an atheist, or at least an agnostic, and and uh, yeah, I think he was atheist. And he yeah, yeah, he he, he was a, he he was an atheist, and he, he was given uh, mere Christianity by a, he was a young man as a pastor, and he read it and was convinced by it and uh then he uh, he, he himself wrote a uh, a very influential apologetic uh work giving his reasons for for, for christian belief so it, he, he's one of quite a few people who were helped very much by lewis and then became apologists themselves so that in, in a way lewis is work is uh, magnified by, by, by the people who like Lewis and then try to carry on the, the work in one way or another. What do you think about the way that different traditions sort of appropriate Lewis? And It's interesting. As, as you mentioned, there, there's even uh, apparently quite a, a substantial Mormon uh, interest in, in Lewis. And I, I think it reflects the fact that Lewis tries very hard to be non-controversial in, 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 in what he says. He's, he's very much a traditional uh, uh, Christian, but he's, he's generous to all sorts of positions. And um, someone remarked that one, one of Lewis's editors, Lewis edits Lewis's books today, said that every religious group that he goes to sort of thinks of Lewis as one of their own, that, 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 that he somehow feels as though he, he, he belongs because he, he, he's so generous, I think, in, in, in his tone. So, so he's very widely regarded. There's, there's quite a Catholic following for Lewis, even though there are there's a Catholic that wrote a book called More Christianity that thinks, well, Lewis is good up to a point, but then you need, you know, you need the church. 
But uh, nonetheless, uh, a lot of different kind of believers like Lewis as far as he takes you. So people might be surprised to learn uh, from your book that contrary – this is a quote from you – contrary to Lewis's expectations that his works would soon be forgotten, he's far better known in the 21st century than he was at the time of his death in 1963. We're speaking with George Marston, and we'll take a brief break and be right back. Do you have questions or doubts about your faith? You're not alone. Many faithful members wonder about aspects of LDS Church history, belief, or practice. Everyone needs a reliable and faithful place to work through questions. The Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship and Deseret Book offer such a place in a book called Planted, Belief and Belonging in an Age of Doubt by Patrick Mason. Planted offers an empathetic, practical, and candid perspective for people struggling with questions and people who love those who struggle. Planted is available now at Deseret Book and online retailers like Amazon.com. We're talking today with George Marston. He is an emeritus professor of history at the University of Notre Dame, and we're talking about his latest book, A Biography of C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. So we left off talking about Lewis's popularity being greater today than it was back when uh, when he was still alive. And what I think a lot of people would be interested to find out is even people who fondly look to Lewis as, as a key figure in their own uh, faith journeys and, and intellectual development uh, don't shy away from pointing out areas where they disagree with him or seeing him as sort of a, an a doorway into a discussion rather than an endpoint. I'm thinking of people like N.T. Ride and other figures like this. So what are some of the main critiques since Lewis uh, passed away uh, that people have made of mere Christianity? Well, I, th- I think there are uh, critiques. When you mentioned N.T. Wright, he, 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 he was very much helped by, uh, by Lewis, but then as a biblical scholar himself, he thinks Lewis is... It doesn't it isn't very sophisticated in his understanding of the New Testament, and 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 so there's things he wants to say that go beyond Lewis, and he's he's one of those apologists who has uh, written his own apologetic work to uh, bring Lewis up up to date, or to, to, you know, to bring him to to a, a different kind of audience. There's also uh, less sympathetic critics of Lewis, of course, as people who are uh, uh, skeptics, uh, often people who, who once were Christian and, and lost their faith, who, who are critical of, of Lewis and, and just think that his arguments are wrong and, and, and there's books published refuting arguments of of Lewis, and, and then there's Lewis defenders who are uh, responding to those those reputations. So there's all sorts of uh, debate about um, you know, about particular arguments uh, in 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 Lewis. But uh, let's say in in general, despite the critiques, most of the arguments stand up pretty well for what they are. That they're uh, not designed to be. Uh, conclusive professional arguments uh, for philosophers, but they are persuasive arguments that that that, that carry a weight uh, uh, with them that uh, is, is very helpful for a lot of people in in thinking through the implications of the of, of their faith. And 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 Lewis is always presenting his arguments in very imaginative ways that he just says in Narnia, he's creating images to represent a sort of Christian world in his, uh, the, the way he writes, he, he uses tremendous number of images to make his ideas come alive. And, and so uh, it's more than just arguments. It's, it's, it's something that helps, uh, you know, People say, "Oh, yeah, now I understand what you're, you know, what 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 he's trying to get at." And, and so it's not necessarily, you know, just 
compelling you to, you know, there's no other logical way out of this, uh, what, what I'm claiming. It's convincing you this really fits with your own experience. One of the major points of criticism that you bring up as well kind of uh, uh, de- deals with women and gender. And you you quote one of Lewis's friends, Dorothy Sayers, uh, who's a, a good friend of Lewis, and she wrote to one correspondent, uh, I do admit that he is apt to write shocking nonsense about women in marriage. Uh, talk about that for a minute, some of the, the things that... Uh, yes, he, he was a mid-20th century uh, male who had the, the, the typical assumptions of mid-20th century males, and, and, and he tended to be uh, even, even somewhat traditional for that time, so he, he, he argued against... The, the idea that that women might be ordained in the in in this Anglican uh, communion, and uh, he tended and 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 when he write, it, there's a chapter in Mere Christianity that where where he writes about uh, gender relations and 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 he has very stereotypical views of the roles men and women should 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 play in marriage and, like and women are that, subordinate men. Men make the decisions, that kind of thing. Yeah, he says. He says men men should be uh, in charge of uh, foreign policy and women in charge of domestic policy. Is that women are too protective of their uh, families to you know, when they're dealing with with their neighbors, and, and men are better at negotiation and, and things that really even at the time we were. I mean, it, it's it's an example of trying to give an imaginative picture of what he, what the point he's trying to make, but it, it doesn't uh, work. And, and certainly uh, these days there's lots of people who are more critical of those traditional views. But the remarkable thing is most people who, who read the book think, well, okay, that's, that's the way people thought back then and you don't really, it, it, you know, not a whole lot. Uh, rests on on on, on those uh, those views, right? In spite of the short shelf life of some of the things in mere Christianity, uh, you talk about how I mean, since two thousand one, it's sold millions of copies. Uh, it's it's been translated into thirty six languages, and then you you conclude your story of the book, the biography of the book, by talking about seven particular reasons why you think mere Christianity has remained a vital source for so many people. One of the reasons you talk about is Lewis's skill at metaphor. He's a poet at heart, and he, he, he compares being Christian to all sorts of things. There's a brief survey that uh, one Lewis scholar points out that becoming a Christian is like joining in a campaign of sabotage or falling at someone's feet, putting yourself in someone's hand, um, laying down your arms and surrendering, saying sorry, learning to walk, learning to write, buying God a present with his own money. And he just goes on and on. So that's one um, reason you, you say that his vivid metaphors really allow Christians to tap into the imaginative side of Christianity. What are some other reasons that you point to as to why this book is still so popular and if impacts so many people? Well, well, one reason is, I think, un- unlike the views on gender, which, which are more dated, most of the book, he makes a really strong effort to represent timeless Christianity. The the as he says in the preface to the when he puts the books together, it's mere Christianity. Uh, this is going to be about the things that Christians throughout the ages have pretty much agreed on, and I'm going to stay away from the things they disagree uh, about. And so. He's looking, he is a student of history, he studies literary history. He's looking for the ideas that have lasted. And so instead of tying most of what he says to mid 20th century ideas, it's he's looking for timeless things. And so lo and behold, 21st century, they're still just as timeless as they were in the middle of the, 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 the 20th century. And so, uh, rather than most of the book seem, seem, seeming dated, uh, a lot of it still can seem uh, quite relevant to people. 
One other thing that I like that you mentioned uh, is about how um, Lewis really did try to point beyond himself. I mean, he's quite a personality, uh, strong personality, uh, and but you also notice that he talks a, he he talks to you as though he's right alongside you, kind of pointing down the road. Yes, I, I think that whole section. I'm I'm trying to say this is supposed to be a biography of a book or the life of a book, and I'm saying, well, what gives the book vitality? And 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 among the other things that I think really gives it lasting vitality or lasting uh, life is that he he he's not simply talking about himself. He's talking about what he sees as perennial truths and what people through in, 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 in many times and many places have also seen as perennial truth. So I see him as uh, like a, a guide on a you know, mountain journey and, and he, he knows the territory, he brings you to a very beautiful spot and points that to you and you, you're, you're overwhelmed by the beauty of the lakes and the mountains. And you're very thankful to the guide, but it's uh, the beauty of the thing he points you to that really has captivated you. And, and I think Lewis is, is, is very good at being that sort of guy that uh, you're aware of his personality, but it's, it's not about him. It's about Christianity. It's about mere Christianity. So I wanted to ask before we go, um, I've interviewed a number of authors of Lives of Great Religious Books volumes, and I the vast majority of these books are about books that are much older uh, than mere Christianity. So I just wanted to ask you about how you think your task differed from someone writing a biography of Genesis or the Bhagavad Gita or something. Instead, you're writing about a book from the 20th century. Yours and uh, the Dietrich Bonhoeffer volumes, I think they're the only two that are so recent. Yes, and, and, and that, I mean, of course, raises the question, this, this is about classic religious books and, and, and will mere Christianity remain a classic? And, and of course, we don't uh, know that, but it's certainly become a classic. And I think he, he, he was certainly more than Bonhoeffer's Letters in Prison, it, it, it's, it's unusual in that it's more popular today than it was in, in, in the mid 20th century. Uh, so, um, yeah, there, there's a, a, a different, and, and, and it's, um, many of the books in this series are books that are officially part of a particular religious tradition, and so you can understand their, their popularity on that ground. Not all of them, like Augustine's Confessions, would be uh, one that's a, a classic it's not required reading, or, you know, it's not a required text anywhere or, or considered to be a, a, a sacred text. But um, so, so you know, I thought the question around which to organize what I'm doing is why this continuing popularity? What, what makes this book distinguished from almost all the other books that were published in the mid 20th century in in, in, in having that continuing vitality. That's George M. Marston. He's a historian of Christianity and American culture and emeritus professor of history at the University of Notre Dame. Today we were talking about his biography of mere Christianity. George, thank you so much for being on the Maxwell Institute podcast. I have enjoyed it. Thanks so much. Thanks so much.